Hey, thanks for tuning in. I'm Susan Gardner, and this is Municipal World Presents. This special podcast series is sponsored by our partners and vendors across the municipal sector. Its goal? To deliver sharp insights and innovative approaches to help guide local governments through their ever-changing challenges and opportunities. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I'm Sean Meyer, and this is Municipal World Presents. Thanks for joining us for this special episode of MW Presents, sponsored by Chenmores. I'm Sean Meyer from Municipal World, and our guests today are Dr. Charles Allgood, Technology Leader, Refrigerants with Chenmores Incorporated, and Omar Mitchell, Vice President, Sustainable Infrastructure and Growth Initiatives at the National Hockey League. Chuck holds a PhD in chemistry from the University of Delaware, and for more than 25 years, he has held a variety of research, technical service, and market development assignments. Omar is working in the Social Impact Growth and Legislative Affairs Department at the NHL and is focused on growing the sport through physical infrastructure, those places and spaces where the sport is played. Today, we're going to be talking about community ice rinks and how they can be cost effective while using sustainable refrigeration. Welcome, Charles. Welcome, Omar. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Good to be here. Thank you. Okay, Omar, why is the National Hockey League concerned about community ice rinks at that local level? Absolutely. And it's a great question. The NHL is concerned about structural barriers to entry to our game. And in this case, we think about things like equipment costs. We think about things like the places and spaces where our sport is played. And in particular, community rink infrastructure. We know that community rink infrastructure, which we consider the front lines of our game, the places where Uh, folks from youth all the way to adults learn our sport and enjoy our sport. This infrastructure is uh, primarily old and um, and typically are using equipment, technology, products, and services that may be outdated. We know that of the 4,500 or so community rinks across North America, approximately 80% of them are 20 plus years old. And we further know that in Canada, as an example, those rates are even higher. Some of those facilities were built even 30, 40, and 50 years ago. And we think about those types of concerns really, really uh, are very, very critical because it's like using a 20 or 30 year old refrigerator in uh, in your home. We wanna make sure that these places are using the latest equipment. We want to make sure that they are using the latest innovations so that we can ensure that the, this infrastructure can continue for the next generation of fans. This is a business imperative for the NHL because for every person that plays our game, we know that they will grow to become future fans as well as bring a mother, a father, a sibling, or a friend to uh, enjoy the sport that we all love. And so from that, we need to address these types of concerns. We need to address this infrastructure. And we need to ensure that we are bringing along and showcasing best practices, showcasing technologies, products, and services, and showcasing the need for why this infrastructure is critical for the growth of our sport. Well, Marty, you've touched on in that past couple of seconds there, just the state of flux between all these various rinks across North America, Canada, for example. What's the general state of these community rinks overall in North America? We're certainly seeing that a lot of these facilities are, because of their age, you're seeing that they're still using a lot of systems and equipment that perhaps have gone well beyond their end of life uh, usage. And that's a function of primarily of costs. That's a function of the fact that there isn't any capital expenditure budgets to upgrade some of these facilities um, for a variety of reasons. And uh, in addition, what we're also realizing and what we're seeing firsthand is that some of these facilities lack some of the expertise when it comes to things that are very important, such as the expertise on um, uh, expertise and, and human capital resources to ensure that these facilities operate effectively. 
think about your facility operator who is driving the ice resurfacer while cleaning the locker rooms, while ensuring that the space, uh, the building is open and, and operating eff effectively. We recognize that this is a, a concern within this infrastructure um, where there's a lack of capital and a lack of operating expenses to ensure that these spaces and places are viable. In addition, we know that there are regulatory concerns that are impacting the industry, particularly one that came out this past January of 2020, where in regards to the types of refrigerants that were used typically in ice refrigeration systems in our community rinks. Uh, this regulatory concern was the phase out of HCFCs or hydrochlorofluorocarbons. Um, and we know it in the rink industry commonly as it refers to as R22 uh, or Freon. This is something that we need to ensure that the industry is educated on best practices, are educated on knowing solutions and viable alternatives to ensure that they can keep up with regulatory concerns like that, as well as the type of best practices to ensure that these facilities continue to thrive given these types of structural concerns. So how is the NHL uh, helping with this process? So we have been actively engaged on a lot of these concerns through our NHL Green platform. NHL Green was a mandate by our commissioner um, that started back in 2010 to really advance environmental sustainability throughout the league and its member clubs. And so uh, in the past 10 years, since we've started green, you've seen a lot of innovations introduced at the frill level. So you'll see things like LED lights. You'll see, see things like real-time building automation systems. You'll see things like innovations in operations whether it's back of house operations or even fan facing front of house operations. This is all in an effort to ensure that the green is doing what it needs to do to reduce its ecological impact where possible. And it's an imperative because it's the right thing to do. What we've seen is, what we've seen is, is once the pros have adopted a lot of these strategies, we wanted to ensure that we were engaging our entire hockey ecosystem to adopt these best practices, not just at the pro level, but bringing it down to the community rink level. And this is what the connection is between what we learn at the, uh, at the NHL clubs and how it can really be impacted at the community rink and the grassroots level. NHL Green was our mandate to ensure that we were really driving this agenda so that there was a forum for best practices from an operations perspective to ultimately have these facilities save money. Because we hope, we hope that if oper uh, community rings can save money, that means that that could get trans transferred on to lower operating expenses, equates to lower ice time expenses, which means growing the sport. And that's what we want to ultimately achieve ensuring that we're growing the sport to the next generation of fans. The other facet of what the NHL is doing to really help ranks is by engaging experts in the space to really address some of these industry concerns. And one example of that was our partnership with Comores, which was based around forward thinking engagement around our environmental sustainability platform. This is a critical and important part of the best practice sharing that we hope the industry will learn from. Because if we can engage the industry around sustainability, whether it's financial, environmental, or social sustainability, we will ensure that our sport will continue to thrive for future generations. You, know, you touched on something I think Chuck should probably speak to. I know that there are uh, changing and evolving regulations, environmental regulations that could impact ice rink refrigeration. Chuck, what is the uh, base of that? How does that look these days? Um, sure, the, uh, the global refrigerants uh, industry is facing a number of uh, transitions and, and influences 
so it's not just uh, community ice rinks, uh, but think of your supermarkets, grocery stores, even your air conditioners, transport, cold storage. Uh, is facing regulatory uh, pressures and changes that impact both the equipment and the uh, refrigerants. And if we go back maybe 100 years, you know, to the birth of refrigeration, it was basically an industrial process that used industrial chemicals as the refrigerants, uh, things like ammonia, hydrocarbons, sulfur dioxide, things that were pretty nasty chemicals. And then in the 1930s was the uh, invention of the Freon class of refrigerants, which were really hailed as miracle compounds at the time because of their non-toxic, non-flammable, had great thermodynamic energy efficiency properties. Uh, so fast forward up into the uh, uh, end of the last century, the 1980s or so, <clears throat> with the uh, publication of the stratospheric ozone depletion uh, theory and the and the link between chlorinated refrigerants uh, and ozone depletion, which gave rise to the industry making a big transition, the Montreal Protocol, uh, widely, widely hailed as one of the most successful international treaties of all time, really got the industry to uh, phase out and transition away from chlorine containing or ozone depleting refrigerants. And we've been operating that way. The uh, Freon R22, as Omar mentioned, is probably one of the last one of those uh, ozone depleting refrigerants that's still in widespread use. And uh, we're transitioning out of that. And uh, so lately you hear more about climate change or greenhouse gases or uh, carbon footprint, uh, global warming potential. Those are all kind of the same way of dealing with a, a new concern. That is the, you know, the climate impact of these Gas is potentially building up in the uh, in the atmosphere, and if left unchecked, uh, could rise to unsafe levels. Yeah, just to round out your question on uh, regulation, so there are some regulations uh, designed to move the transition to lower GWP, lower global warming potential refrigerants. It's not a ban or a phase out in the sense that we got out of chlorine containers, but it's more of a, a cap and a reduction uh, and a change in direction. So it impacts the uh, ice rink industry in a number of ways because historically they've used a lot of R22 and a lot of ammonia, and both of those are facing uh, issues going forward. So if you're uh, looking to upgrade your uh, rink and the refrigeration systems involved in keeping them running top notch, what sort of factors are operators looking at these days, even just maintaining these systems they have? Yeah, right. I always like to point out, you know, we talk about GWP, global warming potential, and that word potential uh, is true. It's a, it's only a potential to impact the environment if it gets out of the system. So I always like to preach, you know, good maintenance, good service practices, reducing leaks, eliminating leaks uh, is probably number one job. It, it, it's a cost savings because you don't have to replace that leaked refrigerant. It keeps your system operating at the highest energy efficiency and, uh, and it's just a good overall, uh, pra a good practice for refrigeration. Um, energy efficiency is, is key uh, for existing systems. You know, you need to look at it. When does it make sense to change it out? Cost comes into it, safety, a number of those. But when you get to deciding on new systems, then a number of these factors really need to be optimized or, or balanced out. If uh, a rink operator's got to have a whole lot of questions then when it comes to just where do I turn? How do I get the help I need in figuring out what my course of action is. When it comes to certainly with ChemWars, yourself, and even Omar, if you're looking at it from an HL perspective, Coolfield, what should people do? Where should they turn? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Omar jump in here in a second. I know uh, the league has some uh, rink engineering experts that they work with. Um, from Camorra's side on refrigerants, uh, we have a number of white papers out there that basically talk about everything you should can should consider when looking at a new system. And you know, on the back of the envelope things, cost is always important. Uh, capital dollars are always scarce and hard to come by, but it's, it's just not first cost. You really need to take a total cost of ownership approach because over the lifetime of these systems and some of them last 20, 25 years, the energy usage usually dominates the overall cost over the lifetime. So you really wanna get something that's gonna be uh, energy efficient. Um, in addition to just the capital cost, installation costs uh, 
can be quite expensive, especially if it has to be handled by a specialist. There's maintenance costs, uh, training. Uh, if you have uh, an ammonia system, you may have to have on-site engineering support uh, based on local regulations. So all those costs, training of your operators, uh, all that needs to be rolled into it. Uh, and then there's the sustainability, regulatory compliant uh, aspects of it, safety. You know, there are things that are, uh, ammonia is very toxic. Some of the other refrigerant aren't as toxic. Um, there's ongoing uh, support, uh, sustainability I mentioned. So it's really, again, an optimization, our best balance of properties. You really need to look at all that. And, and every rank is kind of different. So what's your community like? Uh, what's the infrastructure of the building like? Do you, uh, what kind of operation are you running? Is it seasonal? Is it 24 seven? Is it multi-purpose? Is it multi uh, slabs? All these different types of community rings. So it's, it's not a one size fits all, that's for sure. And then on the NHL side, uh, to Chuck's point, what we've done is we've engaged with a uh, rink engineering expert uh, called uh, Ian Story of IB Story Inc., which um, is a firm based, an engineering firm based out of um, uh, Prince Edward Island as well as in Florida. And uh, with IB Story, we see uh, a rink expert who has been in the industry for quite some time to really drive awareness and education in the industry. Because ultimately, this is what we need to, uh, to ensure that rink owners and operators are educated on what makes the most amount of sense when they are contemplating either retrofits or upgrades or new construction and new development. This is critical because with these types of new innovations, whether it's a sustainability innovation or whether we wanna ensure that this rink infrastructure continues to thrive, there is a lot of new best practices, new uh, technologies that are out there that are completely viable and are things that um, rink owners and operators should consider. And that's what NHL strives to ensure that the marketplace and the industry is educated for you, the rink operator, to make the right solution. That's fantastic. Those are great insights from both of you today. So I wanna thank you both for speaking with us. Very welcome. Sean, thank you. Appreciate being here. If you found the information in today's episode useful, we hope you'll please drop us a note to let us know or give us a shout on Twitter at Municipal World. Until next time, I'm Susan Gardner. Please stay healthy, stay safe. <laughs>